I think we'll start off again uh, like we did yesterday with um, we'll settle in, in a moment into uh, a sort of meditative posture and and then I'll read us the root verses of the six bardos mm. again and um, I was saying yesterday if, if you weren't here these these root verses are um, uh, one of the insight practices that and his uh, given us um, they're packed full of Dharma teaching and um, uh, I'm not gonna sort of be able to unpack all the terms and the technical terms from those root verses uh, but what I what I would say is um, well what, what I was saying yesterday is What's really important to note is that there are these different bardos uh, and that they're given equal weight, the bardo of life, the bardo of dreams, the bardo of meditation, the bardo of um, the moment of death, the bardo of reality as it's called, uh, after death uh, and before rebirth, and then the bardo of taking rebirth. They're all um, in a way given equal status in terms of um, they're all part of uh, conditioned existence. They're different states of consciousness within conditioned existence. And they all have the potential in them for us to wake up to, uh, to, to the unconditioned, to the nature of mind, to absolute reality, to enlightenment. They all have that, that potential. And... Um, Particularly, it's said that after death, there's all these opportunities, and that's what we'll come on to, opportunities to, to wake up, to gain enlightenment. And uh, the instruction uh, in, in the Bardo Tadol is often to do with not fearing what happens after death, because the fear causes us to shrink back from the light of reality. Uh, so somehow reflecting on these bardos reflecting on death is uh, a really good practice for dying uh, and what will happen to us after dying it's sort of that dharma life is, is is like a preparation uh, or you can see it as a preparation for the point of death okay so let's settle into our postures and um, if you're sitting on a chair or sofa just make yourself comfortable You're sitting on cushions, if you're sitting in your meditation posture. And perhaps just feeling the seat or the support under you and the weight of your body falling down through it into the ground, into the earth. A sense of being grounded, rooted. Noticing the breath as it flows through the body. Allowing the breath to soothe the body. Calm the body. And calm the mind. And see if you can connect with a sense of meta. For yourself, 
for all of us here. And for all beings, wherever they are, both the living and the dead. the root verses of the six bardos. Oh, now when the bardo of life upon me is dawning, abandoning idleness, there being no idleness in a devotee's life, entering into the reality undistractedly, listening, reflecting, and meditating, carrying onto the path knowledge of the true nature of appearances and of mind, may the trikaya be realized. Once that the human form has been attained, may there be no time or opportunity in which to idle it away. Oh, now when the bardo of dreams upon me is dawning, abandoning the inordinate corpse-like sleeping of the sleep of stupidity, may the consciousness undistractedly be kept in its natural state. Comprehending the true nature of dreams, may I train myself in the clear light of miraculous transformation. Acting not like the brutes in slothfulness, may the blending of the practicing of the sleep state and the actual or waking experience be highly valued by me. Oh, now when the bardo of meditation upon me is dawning, Abandoning the whole mass of distractions and illusions, may the mind be kept at rest in endless, undistracted samadhi. May firmness both in the visualizing and in the perfecting stages be obtained. At this time, when meditating one-pointedly with all other actions put aside, may I not fall under the power of misleading stupefying passions. Oh, now when the bardo of the moment of death upon me is dawning, abandoning attraction and craving and weakness for all worldly things, may I be undistracted in the space of the bright enlightening teachings. May I be able to transfuse myself into the heavenly space of the unborn, the hour has come to part with this body composed of flesh and blood. May I know the body to be impermanent and illusory. Oh, now when the bardo of reality upon me is dawning, abandoning all awe, fear and terror of all phenomena, May I recognize whatever appears as being my own thought forms. May I know them to be apparitions in the intermediate state. It has been said there arrives a time when the chief turning point is reached. Fear not the bands of the peaceful and wrathful who are your own thought forms. Oh, now when the bardo of taking rebirth upon me is dawning, one pointedly holding fast to a single wish, may I be able to continue the course of good deeds through repeated effort. May the womb door be closed and revulsion recollected. The hour has come when energy and pure love are needed. May I cast off jealousy and meditate upon the guru, the father mother. O oh, procrastinating one who thinks not of the coming of death, devoting yourself to the useless doings of this life, improvident are you in dissipating your great opportunity. Mistaken indeed will your purpose be now if you return empty handed from this life. Since the Holy Dharma is known to be your true need, 
will you not devote yourself to the Holy Dharma even now? I love that um, um, admonition and encouragement at the end of, oh, procrastinating one. Uh, since the Holy Dharma is known to be your true need, will you not devote yourself to the Holy Dharma even now? And, and uh, for me, I keep, I, I think procrastination is something that I'm, um, oh, uh, I fall um, into procrastination very easily. Uh, and I think I need just reminding myself, I could read this every day and, and, and just remind myself that the Holy Dharma is known to be my true need. And can I not just devote myself to it even, uh, even now? Um, I think that's a, that's a wonderful exhortation, even if, even if the rest of the uh, verses doesn't always make complete sense. So yes, yesterday, uh, I just want to pick up from uh, where we were yesterday. So yesterday, I was saying that at the point of death, at the moment of death, um, it said, according to the Bada Tadol, that the clear light of reality <clears throat> breaks through. It breaks through because, um, as it were, the defenses of our body and uh, uh, our sense experience and our identity with the body are, are breaking up. Uh, it's, it's, it's as if we normally are shielding ourselves from the truth, but these defenses break up and there's an opportunity to see uh, the deepest aspect of mind, uh, to see well, Bhante has, has, has called it according to Sabuti. Sabuti led some study on this, this text um, a while back uh, in November. And um, so I'm, I'm sort of basing some of what I say on, on what he was um, uh, saying and leading us through. Bhante has talked about mind behind mind, the mind behind mind, which is um, sometimes talked about in the tradition as the nature of mind. So normally, we, when we think of my mind, I think of all my thoughts, all my memories, all my images, all my um, identities, uh, everything that I think of as me uh, in, in, in my mental world, as well as all my sense experiences from the, the five external senses. <clears throat> but the nature of mind is something else. It's not, it's not anything to do with the content of experience. The nature of mind, <coughs> which is said to be the deepest, deepest, uh, as it were, layer of consciousness of mind, is, um, is, is said to be pure awareness, uh, not awareness of anything, and not awareness owned by anyone. It's not in this dualistic realm of me and mine and the world out there. So it goes beyond self and other. Uh, and, and that that is um, always trying to break through that, that nature of mind is always, as it were, um, it, it wants to be, to use, I mean, I'm, all of this is in a way an as if, as a, as a metaphor, because <laughs> it's not a thing, but it wants, as it were, to be um, unbounded and free and um, not trapped within the, the prison of selfhood that we normally impose. Uh, and 
there are moments in life when it does seem to break free. Um, so I've talked about sometimes there there are moments of um, of uh, devastation when our sense of who we are uh, is shaken or even um, potentially shattered. In those very very difficult experiences, sometimes there's a breaking free and you get a sort of, um, well, you, you glimpse a transcendent uh, a reality. Um, a friend of mine, um, before he, he came to the, the, the Buddhist center, he's, he's now been ordained uh, many years, had a glimpse of that in the bath. He had a glimpse of the transcendent reality in the bath. Uh, and it was at a time when um, the one of the Gulf Wars was uh, going on. He was in the army. He was a nurse, a medic in the army. And um, he was potentially going to be uh, called out to, to Iraq, to, to a war zone. And um, this was incredibly stressful. And so he was under a, a, an extreme kind of amount of stress. Then he's lying in the bath and um, a vision of reality unfolds uh, just, just, just momentarily. But it was enough for him to know that it was, uh, well, in a way he couldn't, he couldn't ever go back from that. He could never go back to just his ordinary uh, uh, experience or ordinary conception of what's going on. Uh, so insights like that can break through at any moment. I find it interesting that he was stressed in that what I imagine is that his mind was extremely focused, albeit in a, in a, um, a worried way, probably with the notion of death uh, hanging over him. So that suddenly all the other sort of trivia of our lives he'd, had probably fallen away. There was this sort of life and death kind of moment and then a relaxing. And I think both of those are important. The intensity of really being focused on what is it that's going on? What is it to be alive? What is it to be alive in the face of our mortality, knowing that in any moment, life could end. Normally, we, we don't live with that sort of intensity. Maybe it's not possible to live with that intensity. But if we could, and we had a sense of something beyond that we could relax into, then maybe, maybe these sort of breakthroughs would arise. Certainly, Dharma practice is all about, it's a sort of systematic way of um, trying to encourage uh, the, the nature of mind, you could say the deepest seat of consciousness, to break through. Uh, and when it does, uh, well, when it does, it's said to be um, a sort of shattering of our normal sense of who we are and incredibly freeing uh, and blissful. And, uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the challenge is, can we live by those peak experiences. Um, so maybe it's happened to you in a less dramatic way. Maybe it wasn't about um, a big experience, but I, I encourage us to, in a way, reflect on any sort of peak experiences where we have, where, which we've had, where we feel uh, that the mind is expanded beyond its normal, normal confines and constructs, and where we feel well, another quality is um, we, we, we sort of lose this sense of feeling separate from the world and from other people, where there's a, a sense of both vastness and of intimacy. Uh, that that and, and a sense of love out of that connection, it's normally um, uh, filled with bliss and with love. Those, those peak experiences, I don't think... Um, are that uncommon. But what happens is that for most people, if they're not consciously trying to practice, those experiences are sort of um, 
They don't go anywhere. They don't then lead to a change in their worldview, a change in their life. They don't seem to necessarily um, lead to that. And they can be sort of just forgotten, really, uh, 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 perhaps even buried. Anyway, what we're trying to do is not wait necessarily till the moment of death uh, for vision to unfold, vision to arise. But also, uh, I, I like to think um, that when the moment of death happens, I hope that my Dharma life has prepared me uh, to accept the opportunity that, that death brings. Um, I heard that the Dalai Lama said that he was quite looking forward to the point of death. I mean, maybe this is apocryphal, but that's what I've heard, that he was quite looking forward to it, to test his practice, to see if his practice really did bear fruit at the moment of death, at the point of death. Anyway, according to the Bada Tadol, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which, as I was saying yesterday, is, um, uh, in a way, it's one model, one schema, uh, and it's not the only one in the Buddhist tradition. And uh, I, I don't think we should be taking it literally. But according to, not all the details of it, but according to that model, um, when the body falls away, yes, there's this opportunity, and yes, it's really difficult to take that opportunity because it's overwhelming. And then what happens if we miss the opportunity of the clear light, if we don't um, uh, let go into the nature of mind, if we don't recognize it as the nature of uh, who we are, then, then in a way there's a falling away. There's a falling away but it's not the end of the opportunities. According to the text, what happens next is um, uh, we're, we're sort of back into the world of duality. There's a there's a more of a sense of self that re-emerges with a mind-made body and a, and a sense of self, but it's duality at its most fine and clear most sort of transparent and what happens is we enter a visionary realm uh, a visionary sort of set of experiences starts to arise and according to the text the archetypal buddhas appear one after another they appear one after another and um, what Subhuti was saying is that he doesn't think that it's literally going to be like that he doesn't think it's going to be necessarily as schematic and tidy as the text suggests, nor does he think that the images will uh, uh, just be Buddhist images. In a way, they're going to be images that we relate to from whatever culture that we've uh, um, imbibed. Uh, these, these images of the enlightened mind appear. And what we're being asked to do by the text is recognize that those images are forms of our own enlightened nature, of our own deepest nature. They're not really separate. This, this duality is an illusion. If we can recognize that, then there's another opportunity. Well, again and again, these images arise, and there's another opportunity after opportunity <coughs> to gain uh, uh, liberation. And according to the, the teachings of the Bhadrat at all, uh, your teacher should read to you uh, uh, particular verses encouraging you to, to not fear the images that arise and to let go into them, to relax, to open up to them, and to recognize them as the nature of our own deepest mind. So, so the assumption is that the person who has died, at least the body's died, but they can still hear, and, and uh, that the verses are read out, um, ideally by their teacher. If the teacher's not there, then by, by uh, Dharma friends. They're, they're read out for the person who's died to remember uh, the teaching. If... Um, 
the person has a particular meditation practice, if they've got a, a particular archetypal Buddha or Bodhisattva that they have meditated upon, uh, well, a mantra can be chanted to remind them. When Bhante died, he said that, I mean, before he died, he said that uh, after his death, he wanted uh, us in, in Tri Ratna to chant five mantras, uh, the Tara mantra, the Padmasambhava mantra, the Manjudosha mantra, um, the Shakyamuni mantra, and, um, oh goodness, I've forgotten. Anyway, there were five mantras that we, we chanted uh, for him. Um, he obviously took it seriously that the mantras and our well-wishing, our metta, uh, would reach him, would reach him. Uh, I think he was very, very well prepared for death. I mean, not just as um, an elderly man who had reflected on death, but I think spiritually, dharmically, he was very, <coughs> excuse me, very um, um, prepared for death. My, my, what am I basing that on? Well, partly it's my faith in him as a, as a dharma practitioner, as a dharma teacher. But um, if you were there, he died um, in 2000 and, um, when was it, 18. Uh, if you were there when he died, it was as if uh, there was just a, a um, well, I, I, I remember being um, at the London Buddhist Centre. I, I had just done um, uh, a six month solitary, which was the longest solitary retreat that I've ever done. And I flew back from Gukiloka in southern Spain, where I'd been doing the solitary. And um, I was sort of looking forward to, to seeing Bante. I'd seen him before I left, wanted to see him again and talk about my experiences of, of the retreat. Uh, he died the morning after I got back. And uh, suddenly, I was thrust into a world of magic. Uh, it was a, a beautiful time. Um, I can remember somebody coming into my room and telling me um, that, that he died and that we were about to start chanting uh, in the shrine room in the London Buddhist Centre. So I went down and other Sangha members had uh, come down and we were just chanting uh, these mantras for him. And the atmosphere was, um, <coughs> both then and in the days that followed, was, uh, well, I think it was sublime. It was, uh, it was full of gratitude. Uh, I think a sense of um, magic. Uh, what do I mean? It was gratitude, but it was as if Bante's consciousness was everywhere. <coughs> it was as if, uh, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd got a frail old body, 93 year old body. And it was as if he was freed from the confines of that frail, frail body. And his consciousness was unleashed and it was everywhere. Um, sitting with his body, I went up to Adishtana sometime later to sit with his body. It was an extraordinarily um, powerful experience, not because, just because of the body, but it was as if his consciousness was everywhere. And then his funeral was, um, was just incredible, really incredible. So, so why am I saying all that? I, I, what I'm trying to say is that death needn't be the frightening, fearful uh, uh, thing that often we associate it with, particularly if we've been practicing, <laughs> if we've been meditating, if we've been reflecting, if we've been uh, cultivating metta and shraddha, there's opportunities uh, that will arise at death. And, um, you know, just watching that documentary, Surviving Death, and um, uh, hearing from people who have had near-death experiences and how positive they were about those experiences. Time and again, people, well, an aunt of mine has had a near-death experience, and she's talked to me about it, and it's again and again I've heard this, that people don't want to come back from those near-death experiences because there's so much love, there's so much bliss, there's so much freedom. Um, they, they don't want to come back, but somehow for those people, their time isn't up, they're not ready to come back. 
<coughs> which then also leads me to reflect on, I don't think it's an accident that we're here. Uh, Buddhism says that, you know, we've come into this life on the, on the winds of our karma. Uh, that's true for everybody. But particularly if you found the Dharma, I think that it's, it's um, well, it's just not an accident that we've come across the Dharma. Uh, I, I, I kind of don't believe that. I, I think that it's, well, traditionally it's said that we must have performed acts of merit uh, in, in previous lives to have found the Dharma and then to have found a context in which we can practice together. Bante has even sort of, um, perhaps sort of just mused that as a whole community, perhaps we've been reborn together. You know, perhaps we've had lifetimes uh, in the Sangha together. So I love all of this. Um, um, I don't, you know, it's not that I can prove anything and I don't know really what I'm talking about, but this mythic sense that life has a purpose beyond life and that the purpose can't just be about getting what I want in this lifetime. The Dharma is pointing to opportunity after opportunity to wake up to the truth. I find that very um, exciting. But anyway, what happens to the, to the person that's died? These visionary experiences arise. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas arise one after another. And if the person doesn't recognize their true nature, if they shrink back, well, they're given more and more opportunities after, you know, one after another. But the, the Buddha figures on the Bodhisattva figures become more and more crude. Uh, it's said that they, they start off really, really peaceful, but then they can become fierce and wrathful. And again, the encouragement is to not be frightened, to recognize these images as our true nature, that they're all coming from uh, mind. Mind, not in the sense of my mind, but the nature of mind as the ground, as it were. And, uh, but what Sabuti was saying is that what he thinks happens is that there's an oscillation going on. On the one hand, the, the, the consciousness of the person will be experiencing freedom um, uh, and a sense of expansiveness now that the body's dissolved or uh, 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 been shared, as it were. On the other hand, they're likely to be experiencing confusion, uh, disorientation, uh, fear, um, and um, bewilderment, and uh, a tendency to grasp after some sort of security, to grasp after some sort of stability. And what Subhuti's was saying is that he thinks what happens is that there's an oscillation between those two, between the freedom, the expansiveness, maybe even a sense of peace and love, and then the disorientation uh, and um, yeah, the confusion and the bewilderment and maybe the fear. And, and that oscillation continues. It's like we're gonna be bounced around. And if we don't recognize the opportunity to, to, to let go into reality, then gradually, gradually, um, the, the force of karma is said to take over and will be attracted to some sort of rebirth. I say some sort of rebirth because uh, the human realm is only one of the realms that you can be re reborn into. Uh, the wheel of life has six realms, but even that's just indicative. There are, there are many planes of existence and we'll be attracted by, by the force of our karma to whatever realm is somehow most, is, is, is commensurate with the level of consciousness that we've uh, got. And, and, um, if we're going to be attracted back to the human realm, uh, it's said that we, we see uh, uh, a copulating couple, a couple having sex, or maybe more than one couple. There's sort of, Sabuti said that there's sort of uh, sex everywhere and we're attracted to one or other of that, that couple. 
and uh, uh, we, we, we want to get in between them and we enter the womb. We enter the womb for uh, uh, another birth. But even at that stage, according to the root verses, you've got an opportunity to, well, first of all, to not enter the womb and not take rebirth and, and remind yourself what's going on. Uh, or choose to enter the womb, but see see your father and mother, your future father and mother, as um, uh, as your guru, so that you 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 somehow elevate that moment of entering the womb into a dharmic moment, so that you when you are reborn, somehow you're reborn with. Uh, a momentum to find and practice the Dharma and to gain enlightenment in human form. So maybe that's what's brought us together. Maybe we've uh, had this uh, uh, urge to find the Dharma uh, and um, uh, maybe it's not an accident that we, we find ourselves here reflecting on, on the nature of life and death. Let me just pause there and see so I'll, we'll open it up for questions uh, again. Um, if, if, if there aren't any immediate questions, there's more that I can, I can say. Let's see if there are questions. No immediate questions. Okay, so this, um, so you can write them in the chat if, if, if you want to. This uh, sense of um, opportunity, I think is what I take away from uh, these verses of, of the Bada Tadol and the root verses. But particularly, they keep on emphasizing don't fear, have faith, and cultivate an altruistic intention. Cultivate an altruistic intention. So I think that that altruistic intention and faith are something that, um, well, that's what we're trying to do in our Dharma lives. And that's what will, I don't know, see us, service uh, most after death. Uh, so, so metta, you could say, love and faith are, are what's needed. In, in, in the, the final bardo, it says, um, the hour has come when energy and pure love are needed. The hour has come when energy and pure love are needed. So um, uh, I find it very exciting anyway. I find it very exciting when I contemplate that um, this life is within a bigger context and the Dharma is pointing me to how to cultivate energy and pure love more and more. So there's, there's um, some questions. Shall we yeah. see? Seb's going to read out the question. So Jackie asked, if all is consciousness, do we come, do we have to come back as human? Hmm. So Jackie, uh, Jackie's asking, if all is consciousness, do we have to come back as human? So let's just take that all is consciousness. It's, it's um, a particular teaching from uh, a school of Buddhism, the Yogacara, um, that says that in a sense, you could think of everything as being of the nature of mind. Uh, again, not not in terms of my mind or your mind. Uh, the, 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 the trouble with that teaching, the Yogacara teaching, is that we can turn the nature of mind into a sort of um, substance, into a, into, a, into a ground of being, into some sort of eternal first principle. And if we do that, we... we in a way, we fall into theism. Uh, it becomes very similar to Hinduism if we do that. So the first thing to uh, remember is that all of these sort of teachings about absolute reality are that it's better to see them as um, uh, metaphors. Uh, in the end, what's said is that none of our conceptual ways of um, apprehending what's really going on is adequate to the situation. Reality is beyond all our conceptual constructions, including Dharmic ones, including Buddhist ones. There's, there's an ungraspability to, to experience. 
And that's true even in this life, let alone the experience after death. But that was just a little, um, that was just to pick up on all his consciousness. And, and, and Jackie was saying, do we have to come back as human? Well, in a sense, we don't. So all of these um, uh, realms are, uh, in a way, they're open to us. In, on the wheel of life, there are some, some realms that are, um, are full of suffering and other realms, the God realms, as it were, that are full of um, bliss. Uh, the human realm is said to be really propitious for gaining enlightenment because it's got, it's got some suffering, but it's also got some joy and pleasure. It's not got so much suffering that the consciousness is overwhelmed in pain and can't think about something higher. But it's not so overwhelmed with pleasure that there's no point in thinking about anything. So the human realm is said to be really a fortunate realm to be born into in order to practice the Dharma and gain enlightenment. But there are also uh, higher realms. Um, and, and the wheel of life, the six realms on that are, are, are I believe, just a schematic. Um, I was listening to Subhuti talk once and he was saying that he was talking to Bhante and Bhante was saying he was convinced that there were other realities, not just, um, uh, in a way, other uh, realms apart from the human realm, but other realities. And he talked about his sort of visionary experiences of these other realities. But yes, the human realm is said to be a very uh, fortunate one, particularly if um, you find the Dharma. I mean, of course, in, in, in the human realm, there's also you know, many people who are in immense states of suffering and uh, don't really have teachings that can lift them uh, to the Dharma. So, so it doesn't have to be the human realm. It might be a higher realm where practicing the Dharma is even easier uh, than um, the human realm. There are God realms, Devalokas, which are where the beings are on the path. Uh, they're Devas of the path rather than Devas of the wheel. And, um, uh, you know, the, their, their bodies would be made of light. There would just be beauty uh, and, um, and, and love. Uh, I, I can remember a dream, a vivid dream that I had once, which was one of those um, sort of semi-lucid dreams. And it was, uh, I was in another realm. I was being shown round another realm. And it was absolutely exquisitely beautiful. Um, but the main thing wasn't just the beauty, uh, um, although that, that was very striking. What I, what I, was left with was that in the realm I was in this dream in, um, everything was full of matter. It was like the air was full of matter. It was like everything was made of matter. And uh, that was such a tangible feeling. That was what I was left with I, when I woke up. But I like to think that it was a glimpse of a, of a, of a divine realm where Meta is the, um, what it's made of. Meta is, is natural, a Brahma Vihara. Yeah, so that was all Jackie's question. So, shall we have another one, sir? Yeah. Josephine asks, you talked about the dream state and dreams asleep. Mm. I was wondering if the intensity of your dreams and the frequency of recollection mm. has increased for you over the years with your meditation practice. Do you believe the dream state can be used as, as a tool of insight in someone's practice? Mm. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yes, so did, did everybody hear that? Maybe I'll um, repeat it. So could I just see the question? Oh, yes. So I've talked, so this is from Josephine. Josephine says that I've taught this week about dreams and uh, I, she's wondering if the intensity of my dreams and the frequency of recollection has increased for me over the years with my meditation practice. And do I believe that the dream state can be used as a tool for insight in someone's practice? Well, if taking the last part first, I really do believe that, yes, dreams can be um, a tool for insight. I, 
they haven't particularly been for me, uh, but uh, I do know of an order member who's <clears throat> who says most of his insights have come to him in, in the dream state. Um, I also know Bandhi used to um, recall his dreams and he would have, uh, according to Paramata, who was his friend and companion for many years, they'd talk about their dreams uh, and um, Bandhi would have these incredibly elaborate dreams uh, of um, uh, Paramata said, you know, one night Bhante said, oh yes, he'd been in the court of Philip II and, uh, and um, you know, all, all of these kind of very, very uh, um, elaborate dreams. My dream life, personally, isn't that exciting and I don't think it's sort of noticeably got more exciting or more vivid uh, <clears throat> over the years of practice. Um, Surya Gupta, uh, who's the chair of the, the LBC, she has a very, very vivid dream life. And often she'll be guided by her dreams. She gets guidance in her dreams, premonitions even. And um, they, they really seem to speak to her. I've had a few dreams where I think that's been the case, uh, where, um, including the one that I was just uh, referring to, where I've been um, shown something and even taught something uh, uh, in the dream. And it was as if it wasn't my ordinary mind having the dream. Um, uh, I know some people have trained themselves in, um, uh, well, remembering their dreams and also in lucid dreaming. So lucid dreaming is when you know that you're dreaming and you're still dreaming. And um, if that happens to you, well, uh, don't go for the obvious pleasures because uh, uh, you can direct your dream and see if you can meditate, see if you can gain insight in that lucid dream, uh, see if you can reflect on the Dharma in that dream. Uh, and traditionally, well, in the Tibetan tradition, there's dream yoga where you literally do practice in your dreams. Um, my um, uh, dream life is, yeah, as I say, not that vivid. Um, uh, I've never really trained myself to remember them. Uh, but I do love sleep, although that's not necessarily a, a virtue when it comes to, to the Dharma. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Josephine. Shall we have one more? Yeah. Uh, so Tom asks, do you think it's possible to remember time before I leave it? Do I think? Oh, you've all disappeared from the screen. Um, uh, now you're back. <clears throat> uh, do I think it's possible to remember time before our rebirth? If you mean previous lives, uh, I think some people do have um, recollections of previous lives. Um, I, I, I remember reading a book by um, a man called Jim Tucker called Return to Life. He's featured in this surviving death documentary on in episode six. And Jim Tucker is, a, is a, um, an academic in the University of Virginia. And him and his colleague, his is sort of, uh, he's the protege, protege of uh, uh, a man called Ian Stevenson. And Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker have researched into children with past life memories. And what's most, uh, you know, over, over decades. And um, what seems to be the case is that kids who have past life memories seem to forget them, I think by the age of four or five. But when they're very young, they can have these past life memories and the really convincing ones are where what the child says about their past life can be um, corroborated. You know, if they give names and places and uh, family names and relationships and even talk about how they died. And if there's uh, corroborative, if that's provable, then that's very, very convincing for me. Um, so I think it is possible to uh, recall past lives. The Buddha on his um, enlightenment, you know, when he's sitting under the Bodhi tree about to gain enlightenment or as part of the enlightenment experience unfolding, is said to have recalled all his past lives, uh, seen, seen them all, and, um, and then seen uh, uh, other beings um, in a vision, seeing them dying and being reborn again and again according to their karma. And uh, well, I, I, I don't have any kind of past life memory myself. Um, not really. I've sometimes had 
sort of intuitions, but you know, I, I don't think they, they amount to more than that. But what I do um, take from that is, um, well, I, I do like to think that um, I've practiced the Dharma before and that I've chosen this life in order to practice the Dharma. Now, I've got no real evidence for that. But for me, uh, that imaginative sort of mythic sense is, um, is a sort of motivating uh, force um, and helps me stay on, on the path uh, uh, that somehow the Dharma is um, what I was here to find and, and, and to practice. Um, and of course, that might not be literally true, but uh, in the absence of any other sort of um, evidence, I don't see the harm in adopting that view. Yeah, yeah. I know that there's. Um, I came across. I've forgotten his name, but somebody on um, on on the internet is, you know, you do sessions of past life regression therapy and things, uh, and I tried it once and recently actually, and in a way he just led us into led us into a very relaxed uh, meditative kind of body scan kind of state and then asked us to use our intuition and see what happens so i think intuition is a is a valid thing um but i've heard that some for some people past life regression therapy can be helpful for um um in a way uh dealing with issues that they've come into this life with. But I can't say that I can recommend it because I've got no real experience of it. So, so um, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah. Should we have another? Yeah. Uh, Stephen asks, is non-dual meditation practiced with, within the tree like that? These can include techniques which allow you to drop subject, object, Okay, so where's Stephen's question? Is non-dual meditation practice within Tree Ratna? These could include techniques which allow you to drop subject object. So um, I wouldn't say it's so much non-dual meditation as meditation practices that point to uh, 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 a non-dual state. Um, so they're insight practices. Uh, and yes, Tree Ratna has a number of insight practices uh, that Bante gave us, that he recommended us to, to do. They all point to this freedom from subject and object, from letting go of identification with one's experience as me or mine, uh, and also going beyond the notion of a, a world out there, the object, as it were, being um, a, a separate and... Um, substantial entity that's that's objective as it were so um those insight practices those vipassana practices are normally given in people are introduced to them at ordination one of the reasons that um that is is that in order to practice these practices effectively you've got to have built up quite a healthy sense of self before you deconstruct that sense of self, uh, you've got to have built up quite a healthy sense of um, of, of meta, because it's possible to start deconstructing self in meditation prematurely and then end up um, uh, in a more more of a mess than than we started off with. So so these practices sometimes come with a bit of a health warning uh, and. What Bhante has given us in Tri Ratna is a very complete system of practice that includes the stages of integration uh, and positive emotion, particularly through practices like the mindfulness of breathing and the metta bhavna. But then it includes also what, what he's termed spiritual death practices, where we, uh, we reflect on our experience in the light of these uh, essential teachings that point us beyond subject and object so that we can glimpse something beyond that, a reality beyond uh, me and mine. And then 
there's spiritual rebirth. So he's given us practices which, in a way, reveal uh, the sublimity and all the qualities of the enlightened mind, um, sometimes personified as the, the archetypal Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So the wisdom, the, the love, the, the fearlessness, the energy, the compassion, the peace, the equanimity of the enlightened mind. He's given us practices to, to realize uh, those qualities. Uh, so yes is, is the short answer, Stephen. Um, and uh, the meditation practices are, are mostly introduced when somebody is ordained. The other reason is that with ordination, what you're doing is you're making a commitment to enlightenment. You're saying that I am taking a solemn vow to in this life and for lifetimes practice till I reach enlightenment and not just for my own sake, but with an altruistic motivation to help others also reach enlightenment. So you take those vows of ordination and it's with the seriousness of that commitment that these practices can really bear fruit. They're not, um, they're not sort of to be dabbled with in a, in a sort of casual way. They're too powerful and potent for that. They, um, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, the, the higher tantras would be secret and passed down from teacher to disciple when the disciple's ready to receive them. Uh, so there are, th th there's, there's um, other reasons as well uh, connected with the commitment made at ordination. Yeah. Maybe that's a good place to, to, to end for uh, this, this afternoon. So, um, yeah, come back tomorrow. I hope you will. I hope, I hope this has been interesting. Tomorrow I'm going to be trying to look at um, the question that I think Mercher asked a couple of days ago, which was what happens to the Buddha when his body dies? Uh, what happens at the Parinirvana of the Buddha, given that he's already enlightened, given that his mind is already beyond subject and an object, uh, what happens to him? So uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about that, around that. Um, I can't promise you answers, but I can promise you uh, 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 a sort of discussion around the mystery of it. And... Um, and then that will be the final session of this, this, this series. So once again, um, maybe I, yesterday I was asking you to reflect on the ways that we construct, that you construct a sense of identity. Uh, maybe carry on doing that if, you, if, if, if that seems a fruitful thing to, for you to be doing. But also, uh, if you want to, I'd encourage us to sort of cultivate or dwell in a more mythic sense that this life isn't the only life that we've been here before and that we'll probably be here again and what does that do to your sense of being alive now to know that we are on a you know a, a, a vaster trajectory so maybe i'll leave you with that that question um and and yes once again thank you for any dana uh, that you've been giving. Uh, Seb's going to just post the link to uh, the dana uh, now, and um, it will be really, really gratefully received. So yes, do do keep giving if you if you possibly can. And I'll see you. Hopefully, I'll see you same time tomorrow to talk about the Buddha's Parinirvana. Good. Thank you very much. Cheerio. Oh, we can unmute. We can unmute. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye bye, bye, -bye all. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.